First and foremost, I would like to thank our partner today, uh, which is the uh, British Israel Communications and Research Center, BICOM, who came up with this idea with us uh, a few months ago and initially had planned for a relatively small event, a relatively small workshop, which has since grown into something much, much larger and is a reflection, I think, of really the need for strategic thinking at this particular time in an area of great instability, but also great opportunity for the United Kingdom. And it's at times like this when, even though I've worked in a think tank for almost 10 years, I finally work out what a think tank actually does. And I'm reminded of something my former director general said in a video that I used to have to play in my travels around the region. Professor Mike Clark used to talk a lot about how Whitehall in 2011 stood in ferment. And at that particular time, the need for think tanks had never been greater. Well, if Whitehall was in ferment in 2011, in 2019, I think we can call it on the verge of nuclear meltdown, in which case, should Mike's point be correct, the need for a think tank is even more greater than it has ever been. And I'm also reminded from the same video, I played this video a lot, so I can almost quote it verbatim, of Sir Michael Howard's quote about Britain losing an empire and not yet finding a role. And actually, despite the fact that Dean Acheson mentioned this in the 1950s and Michael Howard quoted it again in 2011, that is still more apt than ever. And I think as we turn inwards towards ourselves, the need for our continued strategic presence in the Middle East, but also across the world, has not gone away. The world does not stop turning simply because we've become interested in what our belly buttons look like. And at that time, in a place like the Middle East where security challenges are ever present, demographic change is ever present, instability is a continued factor of regional politics, there has never really been a greater time to sit back and calmly think about strategic interests in the medium and the long term. I've often been asked during my career, when I go into some long explication about what some Gulf country thinks of another Gulf country and who is up and who's down and whether this prime minister is going to take over from that uh, emir. Well, that's very interesting, Michael, but why do we care? And I always have to scratch my head a little bit and I always think, well, it must come down to money and security. Yes, minister, that's what it is. We make a lot of money out of the place, so that's why we care. And it's very insecure, so that's why we care as well. Certainly those two points are true to some extent. If we look at Britain's security interests in the region, they are extensive. We have deployed three times in 25 years to Iraq, to Libya in 2011. We are at the forefront of negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. We have a string of bases in the Persian Gulf in which British personnel are permanently deployed to the extent now where some talk of a return to east of Suez. And of course, we are ever present in the ongoing conflict in Yemen, which has been raging since 2015. We are also close to Tunisia, in which we are tied intimately to that government and its security protocols since the attacks in Sousse against British tourists, and also to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. There are many areas of the Middle East and North Africa in which Britain is intimately tied in fields of security. In economics, I should think that the Explanations for that are obvious. The Shard, Central London, Mayfair, over 100 billion pounds of investments come into London from the Gulf countries. Over a quarter of a million expats of working age sending remittances back to this country. Our involvement in Vision 2030 and the expansion of Saudi Arabia's economy and private sector is of critical importance to our long-term strategic footprint in the region. And of course, the most controversial aspect of that is our defense relationships leading to defense sales, of which, as you all know, there is an extensive debate going on today. But let's be honest, it's more than just defense sales. It's more than just economics. It's more than just security. And maybe somewhere in the back of our heads, Peter O'Toole walks through Wadi Rum, attaching us in a romantic way to a region that perhaps in our minds we wanted to leave but never really left, and of course the famous explication of our policy in the Gulf is that we left through the front door and jumped straight in through the back window.
And to some extent, I think that is true, but there are reasons from a mixed historical legacy, which is in some ways positive, in many ways negative, but that intimately connects us into the region's past, its present, and also its future. Perhaps it is socio-cultural, the fact that in Jerusalem, the center of three great faiths, we are historically connected and will be for many, many years, perhaps centuries to come. And I ask myself this question. Today, we see continued unrest in Hong Kong, the raising of a British colonial flag in Hong Kong, an area that until 1997 was British. Yet, I ask you this question. Would you see 1,000 British citizens traveling to Hong Kong to fight for its independence in the way that you have done Syria, in the way that you have done Libya, in the way that you have done Iraq? British citizens traveling to Israel and Palestine to be involved in that conflict. I put it to you that that is not the case. And there is something about the Middle East which does draw people to the region from this country in which we are intimately tied and will remain so. And again, it comes down to more than just money and more than just security. And so the aims of this conference today are really to think strategically about our policy, to situate our geopolitical interests in a world which is ever-changing, and we ourselves have changed following 2016 and our decision to leave the European Union. We must also situate those interests in longer-term trends to map out the challenges that lie ahead of us. And one of the aims of this conference is not just to talk about the here and now, but particularly in the third session today, to look at some of the medium-term trends. It is often said that most of the region is under the age of 35. I hear 60%, 50%, 40%. The truth is no one knows because no one's done the real counting. But what we do know is that the population of the Middle East will double by 2050. That produces challenges, not just here domestically, but of course for our allies and partners in the region and also in Europe. Economic development, such as has been put forward by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to diversify his kingdom away from reliance on oil and to a more vibrant economic future. Climate change. Some predictions are dire. That by the middle of this century, the Gulf states may well be seeing temperatures in the summertime of over 60 degrees centigrade. How will that affect their national interests, our national interests? If, as Theresa May says, that the Gulf security is our security, then it should stand to reason that a country suffering from 60 degree heat in the middle of the day should probably concern us. There will be ramifications that we must think about. And of course, most importantly, the aspirations of young people. If the region itself is young, then it sounds logical that young people and their interests must be discussed. After all, what were the revolutions of 2011 about if in 2019, those aspirations have not been met, and demographic and economic indicators all point to some form of continued instability in the future. The United Kingdom, therefore, needs to think deeply about all these challenges, not just for the sake of its own security and its own prosperity, but for the people of the region as well. The aims of this conference will be to look at all these challenges in their entirety and situate our policy to scrutiny, and to look at ways in which we can think about improving, adjusting, and planning for the future. And with that, I would like to thank you all and welcome our first panel today, consisting of three very well-known speakers who I'm sure you all know. Baroness Catherine Ashton, who is a trustee of this institute and, of course, former High Representative for Foreign Affairs of the European Union. Sir Mark Lyle Grant, who was our chief diplomat at the UN and former national security advisor, and of course, a man you all know well um, from this institute, former director general, Michael Clark. So it just remains for me to say thank you to you all. I hope you enjoy the day and to invite Baroness Ashton for a few comments. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you, Michael, and thank you to everyone for being here. I thought, in the opening remarks, I would just try and unpack this idea of global Britain, which has been discussed um, quite widely now <clears throat> in the context of what happens to British foreign policy in the future, 
assuming that we leave the European Union at some point in the not foreseeable future? Let me put it that way, because I'm not quite sure what and when and how and if and all that. So um, I want to set out four or five challenges that I think are going to be really important and then try and relate those to the region um, that, as Michael has said, has been deeply significant to the history, security and foreign policy of this country. The first is that Britain has been extremely good at being able to magnify its own priorities through other institutions. In the European Union, which is the one I know best, uh, having chaired the Foreign Affairs Council for five years, there was no doubt what British priorities were, and there was no question that they would be listened to and addressed by all nations as a collective group. And I think one of the issues for Britain going forward will be how to find ways to continue to amplify and magnify its own priorities. Examples where this has been true would be obviously countries like the relationship with Pakistan or Afghanistan, as two that Mark will remember well from his work as National Security Advisor, but there are many more examples that I could pick upon. And this has certainly been true in the UN, of which we'll still be part, but it's especially important in the context of our near neighbours. So the question number one of, of Global Europe is, how is the British foreign policy imperative going to be able to be magnified and channeled through institutions, particularly through Europe, where the magnification has been to the benefit of British foreign policy and, of course, to the countries or issues that we have chosen to be in the forefront of trying to resolve. And that's no mean feat to think about how that can be done, but it is something that's going to be incredibly important uh, in the future. And that's going to be true in thinking about how in the region, the Middle East, what Britain believes should happen, how it wants to develop its relationships, how much it will be seen by those countries to be able to magnify that relationship, because that will affect the importance that they attach to Britain. The second issue is how Britain is going to use what are inevitably limited resources to be as effective as it's been, or even more effective as it would uh, desire, in looking at issues that affect British foreign policy or indeed the global challenges that we want to face as a nation and whether we're able to do what you might describe as a scattergun across all issues and across all countries of the world. Because with limited resources, and every nation faces that, one has to think about how best to develop the strategy. The example I always use is Norway. It's much smaller, much more, uh, or much less involved in some ways on some of the issues that Britain has been engaged with. But when people think about Norwegian foreign policy, they can usually identify three or four key blocks. It will be about negotiation. It's the place to negotiate. It's the Norwegians being able to be honest brokers, involved and engaged in different crises and areas across the world. They'll probably think about the fact that Norway has a very strong European policy for obvious reasons. And they'll think about energy and energy security issues because of Norway's role there, and probably could identify two or three other issues where Norway has taken a particular role in Myanmar or in uh, South Sudan, uh, areas where Norway has put its particular resources. My point being that we're not Norway, my point being that you have to think about, as a country, whether you're going to specialise in the work that you do, whether you're going to take particular issues, regions, countries, ideas, and translate those into a unique and different foreign policy that sets you apart, rather than being engaged everywhere. 
and, and it's choices within that that are going to be incredibly important. And as new governments come in, those are the sort of issues that they're going to have to think about. And again, in the context of the nations of the Middle East and the issues of the Middle East, whether that is a Middle East peace process, whether that's a continuing engagement in the uh, E3 plus 3 and Iran, whether that's the relationship with the Gulf nations and the role of the GCC, whether it's a continuing relationship militarily, educationally with the region, those are going to have to be part of the thinking about priorities and indeed what I would argue is specialisms. The third is building new collaborations. An, an area that's been interesting for me is seeing not just the growth of groupings of nations trying to emulate other groupings. The Africa Union builds its structures absolutely on the European Union. ASEAN has come together, first of all, economically, but is trying to look at deeper issues from human rights uh, and its relationship as a group to the rest of the world, uh, and so on. So too, for Britain, we're going to have to think about how do we engage with different groupings. In some of them, we're already observing or a member of sorts, but there'll be others where it will be entirely a new field for us to be operating solo. And I think that's going to be important in those organisations, but it's also going to be important in the context of what I've uh, described simply as informal groupings. The friends of is one example. The contact group of another example. The E3 plus 3, arguably, although it's under UN Security Council mandate, is an informal grouping of countries who traditionally do not come together. And the advantage of the informal grouping is that it enables you to tackle subjects with your partners, in quotes, who would not be your partners in the broader, deeper set of relationships that you have. I describe it simply that when we were doing the Iran negotiations, Russia and China were partners with the US, the European nations, and the EU who were leading the talks. At the same time as we were in dispute over what was happening in Ukraine. And yet these two different elements of the relationship, if you like, one extremely challenging and difficult, the other as a collaborator, continued at the same time. And so the informal grouping, where Britain has played a role in convener for some of these groups, particularly the friends of or contact groups, is going to be also an important element that this country is going to have to think about. And again, back to the Middle East, where getting groupings together, the GCC has become more challenging of late because of the relationships, especially with Qatar where you have countries who are trying to uh, develop groupings to address joint challenges, where the relationship, I would argue, between Israel and the Arab nations is changing, where Egypt's role is a different role, where the Arab League is not perhaps as high profile as it was, and so on, where I think these informal groupings are an opportunity to start to try and address particular questions and where Britain uh, should play a role. It goes back to a premise that I've always thought is so important to understand, which is there is no issue that we face that we can deal with alone. It, there isn't one. If you think of climate change or the possibility of pandemics, so you think of where conflicts begin but rarely stay, they move, they affect people, they affect our citizens abroad, they affect our citizens at home, um, all of the challenges that we face will require us to talk to and collaborate with others in order to resolve them formally or informally. That will remain the case in the future and I think will become even more of an issue in the future. So if you start from the premise of collaboration being vital, the question is how best to collaborate what are the ways in which you can collaborate and how important that's going to be. And that plays into, of course, 
some of the biggest relationships that we have, multilateral ones. Mark will talk far more eloquently than I will about the relationship with the UN, though I am concerned that as a Security Council member, not connected anywhere else, that it will become perhaps interesting to see how far Britain is the go-to country for the Security Council, when France will be able to uh, advocate on behalf of all of the other EU countries, and where we know the relationships between Russia and China, and of course, the US. So the permanent membership and the relationships will be interesting to follow, but especially where the UK chooses to place its advocacy, and again, whether it chooses to specialise or wishes to become known for its work on a particular set of issues in the future. But also, of course, in the big relationships that are going to dramatically affect us in the future, of which the United States is the most obvious, and this strong transatlantic relationships, which sort of wobbles from time to time, but is still, in my view, very strong and incredibly important. How we are going to manage the relationship with Russia, which is at best challenging, and of the growth of China. And again, seeing how far nations connected to the One Belt, One Road initiative are growing in their links with China, economically especially, but how far China is going to be a strong economic influence and how far we as a nation are going to work out how we're going to rise to the challenges of China in the future. So just some thoughts for our opening on the issues that I think are going to affect how British foreign policy will develop in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to build on what uh, Cathy Ashton uh, has said a little bit and look schematically about where I think the UK foreign policy um, should and is likely to go over the next five years or so. Um, because it's become a little bit of an axiom now. Mark Rutter of Netherlands said it recently that Britain's international standing is going to be damaged as a result of Brexit. Um, and I want to make two points about that, really. The first is that it is undoubtedly true that Britain's international standard, standing is being damaged during the process of Brexit. But I see no reason why our international standing should be damaged in the longer term. And the reason I say that is that Britain's international standing has never depended on our membership of the European Union. It has been a function of our history, of our economy, of our culture, of the English language, of the royal family, of the elite uh, institutions, the university, the armed forces, etc. That is what I have represented uh, as an ambassador for my country over the last 30 years. And those basic characteristics of the country are the same as they were before we joined the European Union and they're the same as when we were part of the European Union and they're the same uh, when we leave the European uh, Union. And a recent British uh, Council survey actually rather confirmed that because it was a survey of young people outside Europe, admittedly, around the world, and none of them saw as part of British fundamental identity our membership of the European Union. When they thought about Britain, from wherever they were in the world, that's not what they thought about. And it was very clear to me, because I was in New York as ambassador at the time of the, in 2014, that Scottish independence would have been much, much more damaging for Britain's international standing than Brexit ever could be. Because it would have taken away part of our population, part of our economy, we'd have to change the name of the country. A whole series of things would have flown from that that do not flow from uh, Brexit. Now, of course, it raises a fundamental question about which Cathy raised about whether we want to be global Britain or whether we want to be niche Britain. Um, maybe it's because of my professional background or maybe it's an imperial hangover, um, but I certainly believe that the British people will not want to be a larger Norway or Netherlands. 
but will still aspire to being uh, what you might call uh, global Britain, although the government is trying to move away from that phrase. But just asserting it, just saying we're going to be global Britain, of course, doesn't mean anything at all. You've got to back that up with some uh, action and some uh, resources. And a number of relatively good decisions have already been taken in that direction um, in the last couple of years. The reaffirmation of extending the nuclear deterrence for the next uh, generation, the next 40 years or so, the reaffirmation of the 2% on defense, the 0.7% on overseas aid, uh, the putting more troops into Eastern Europe to defend against the Russian threat, doubling the number of uh, troops in uh, advising, um, training troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, doubling the number of UN peacekeepers, expanding the diplomatic network, etc. So a number of decisions have been taken, but frankly, a lot more is going to need to be done. The second point I want to make is that Brexit or no Brexit, in Britain's fundamental posture in the world doesn't really change. For the last, certainly since the Second World War, our posture has depended essentially on three bridges over a sea. There's been a bridge to the United States, a bridge to continental Europe, a bridge to the rest of the world, and the sea is the rules-based international order uh, in which we swim. Now, it is true that whilst we were members of the European Union, the bridge to continental Europe became much shorter and much fatter. But let's not kid ourselves, it was always still a bridge. You know, we joined late, we were always slightly semi-detached, we were never part of the Euro, never part of justice uh, and home affairs. And so it never really fundamentally changed that fact of us being an island with the three bridges. Now, let's look at those three bridges. Um, United States. We have more policy differences with the United States administration, the Trump administration, than at any time in my 30 years, for nearly 40 years, in uh, public service, whether it's on climate change, or Iran, or the Middle East peace process, or Huawei, or any number of issues I could mention. But it doesn't alter the fact that the United States is and will remain our fundamental number one security partner and essential to our security, whether on the nuclear, defense, intelligence um, side. Europe is still going to be absolutely critical, and our relationship with our European uh, continental partners is going to be absolutely critical, and no amount of blue sea linkages is going to substitute for that. Obviously, within the European Union, there are countries that are more important for us than others, France and Germany, uh, obviously right at the top. And as Cathy said, I think we need to make more use of some of these informal networks, whether that's the E3, as it's called, the UK, France and Germany, or on security issues, the P3, sort of France, US uh, and UK. Those will become uh, extremely important. And personally, I think we should be looking for an iconic project that will link us to France and preferably Germany as well in the future, rather along the lines of the, the Channel Tunnel or Concord or the Eurofighter, you know, something not necessarily in the defense field, but that as we lose the institutional linkages, we can build a project linkage which will bind us to our key partners in Europe for the next 20 uh, to 30 years. And then we have the bridge to the rest of the world. And that's not just about trade deals, although of course that's going to be uh, uh, fundamental. But if we're gonna make a reality of global Britain, we do have to build on the Gulf strategy that uh, the David Cameron government uh, brought uh, into play after 2010 and we'll be discussing later uh, in the day. But also in the Far East, the linkages with Japan as our closest security partner, the, the five power defense uh, arrangements in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, we're going to have to build all these linkages um, back up. And we might want to uh, reinvigorate, as they say, the Commonwealth. Now, this is a hoary old chestnut that's been around all the time I've been in public service, um, not very successful 
efforts have been made to sort of put more emphasis on the Commonwealth. My view is that if we're going to be serious about it, and I think we should, we have to address the three things that the Commonwealth partners want. They want trade, they want aid, and they want visas. And if we're not prepared to give them that, to change our policy as we now can, as outside the European Union, to give preference to Commonwealth countries in those areas, then we shouldn't talk about reinvigorating um, the Commonwealth. And then lastly, the C, because the C is probably the most important issue of all, because this rules-based international order that was set up after the Second World War by the victors of the war, by us, um, and it was built in our image, in a liberal image, based on the rule of law, human rights, and open trade. And that, as every commentator is saying, is under unprecedented threat now uh, as a result of developments over the last, really only the last five or six years, um, to such an extent that Putin can say at the weekend, as he did, that liberalism uh, has now served its purpose uh, and is obsolete. Well, if that is the case, we are in serious trouble if we aspire to remain, and maybe there's a question mark about this, ourselves a liberal country that is animated and supports uh, the value system uh, that goes um, with that. We're going to need to defend that system, I believe, um, because clearly the President of the United States is not going to uh, defend it over the next two or six years. How do we do all this? Well, I don't think we need to be in a funk. Um, we do still have a lot of assets. We are still a nuclear power. We are a permanent member of the uh, UN Security Council. We are a member of NATO. And in fact, we are a member of more international bodies than any other country in the world, even after Brexit. Many of them, these sort of informal groupings that Cathy was talking about, which are absolutely fundamental and Many people won't have heard of many of them, but Britain is in them simply because of historical fact, and they are going to become even more important uh, after Brexit. But our most important leverage, where is our angle? What is our USP? In my view, our most important leverage is going to be our soft power, because we cannot pretend we are going to have the same hard power that we've had in the past not just because of Brexit, just because of historical trends and relative shifts in the global economy and military power, etc. But our soft power is still extremely strong. In the recent survey uh, of the soft 30, I think it was called, survey, Britain was again voted number one in the world in soft power. China was number 27, if I remember um, correctly. And that's a factor of the 0.7 and the royal family and the culture, the music and the film, the language, the university, the sport, you know, the Premier League, the media, the city of London, the 10 million Brits overseas. All these aspects of soft power are a massive asset for this country and it's what we're going to need to leverage uh, a lot more uh, in the future. But there is no doubt that we will be operating in a more challenging and a more fragmented environment than ever before. The US-China relationship is the fundamental one that's going to dominate uh, international governance over the next 20, 30 years, and we don't know exactly where it is going to go, but the high risk of it being a conflictual relationship uh, is obviously uh, right there. Technology is going to be the main battlefield of that relationship. Um, and therefore, we are going to face some very difficult choices. You know, when I was Secretary of the National Security Council, most of the debates we had were a discussion of three bubbles. The security bubble, the prosperity bubble, and the values bubble. And the best discussions in the National Security Council were discussing the tension, because normally there was tension, between those three things. And if you look at the relationship with China, the relationship with Saudi Arabia, these three bubbles come 100% into play. Are you going to prioritize your economic relationship, your security aspects, or the values system? And those choices are going to become more <coughs> acute after Brexit than they were, for the simple reason that we will lose the EU cover, because it's relatively easy to take a tough line 
on militarization of the South China Sea or what's happening in Hong Kong or what's happening to the Uyghurs in Southwest China if you are doing so as part of the EU bloc because China cannot uh, really retaliate against the EU as a whole. Britain, we will have that choice because we know that China will take it out on us, will deny us contracts. There was a classic example just not a couple of months ago where New Zealand uh, airplanes were banned from landing in China because they'd found some part of uh, New Zealand air which hadn't uh, colored in Taiwan in the right color. And suddenly they just banned all flights landing in China. Now that's the sort of bullying tactics that big powers, and it's not just China of course that uses these tactics, but really big powers can use against smaller powers. They can't do it against the European Union, they will be able to use it against Britain. And that's why some of these choices between the security bubble, the prosperity bubble, and the values bubble will become much sharper for us and will make uh, governance decisions very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. And uh, last but not least, Professor Clark. Mm. Michael, thanks. Um, oh, Baroness Ashton, Sir Mark, thank you very much. I, I wanted to uh, reflect on some of those uh, same problems, um, and I have a, certainly no difference of substance, a little bit of difference of emphasis, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but I, I've just finished a study uh, that's coming out in November on British security for the 2020s, and the thesis of that study is that the 2020s was, was always going to be a more difficult decade for Britain, a more troublesome decade for Britain than we might have wanted. It was always going to pose some fairly unique challenges. And Brexit ups the risks, it ups the stakes, it, may, it creates some new opportunities, but it also uh, ups the stakes and the risks of failure. Um, it's more of a tightrope walk than it might otherwise be. <clears throat> and I, I, I want to mention Brexit now and at the end, and then deal with the 2020s in the middle. But my, my thesis really is that um, post-Brexit Britain will take some time to arrive. Um, if we leave on the 31st on Halloween, 31st of October, it will still take at least 10 years for post-Brexit Britain to arrive, by which I mean that in that decade, either we will um, show that it is possible to be a strategically integrated, economically decoupled, but, but a vibrant independent power with a vibrant, independent foreign policy. That's plausible. Um, or it may be a decade of damage limitation, of trying simply to underpin all of the virtues that Sir Mark and Baron Sashton mentioned um, as the terms of trade move against them. Or it may be a decade where we struggle, and this is what, of course, we all fear, where we struggle to hold the union together against the pressures that Brexit might create, and in a decade we simply become the sick man of Europe by 2030. So as, as a success, damage limitation, or disunion and failure face us in the next 10 years, um, and some, some oscillation between those possibilities is entirely likely. And while that is going on, we're going to have to deal with the 2020s. So, you know, what do the 2020s consist of for, from a security point of view? Firstly, a, a, a big conceptual problem, which Sir Mark dealt with as National Security Advisor all the time. You know, what is security for a modern digitized economy that where security is everything from dealing with natural disasters right through to cyber, terrorism, serious organized crime, and the possibility of military conflict and even war? Um, that's the spectrum for a modern power. So there are conceptual challenges to, uh, to deal with those things. And I think um, we've, we've dealt with them intellectually pretty well in the last 10 years. I think we've grasped those conceptual challenges really quite well. Whether we're doing enough to implement the policies that we know we need to follow, that's the question. But that we understand the nature of the problem, I think, is, is reasonable. Um, but understanding it and, and addressing it, of course, are two different things. But the other aspect of the 2020s, apart from the conceptual challenge, is what I call the geopolitical wheels. The geopolitical wheels are turning really quite quickly now. And of course, the three geopolitical wheels that really worry us are China, Russia, and the United States. The, the China wheel, of course, is the one that, that bothers us. Um, we mentioned the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. It is the game changer, the potential game changer. 
uh, trillion dollars committed, as far as we know, from 2013, when it was first mooted, up to maybe six trillion dollars uh, by 2030. Um, in conception, as far as we can tell, it covers about 68 states, about 65% of global population, about 40% of global GDP. If it's only partly successful, it will be a game changer. If it is unsuccessful, it will be a game changer in the way it is unsuccessful. And if it is successful, it will be a game changer. Either way, it's, it's not going to disappear as a phenomenon. It's out there and it is, it's turning the wheels. And of course, there's lots of, of, of ideas about what this will mean. Some worry about the Thucydides trap, the idea that, that uh, a, a rising power and a declining power are, will tend to go to war because of the, the nature of their uh, relationship. Um, another idea that, the, that Donald Trump really wants his premiership, his uh, presidency to be determined by the grand deal. If he, if he wants anything in history, he wants to rebalance the relationship between America and China in a grand deal. That's in, entirely plausible, and who's to say he won't? Maybe it'll be a, what's been termed a new medievalism, a sort of a multi-layered uh, relationship that takes place in so many different ways. It almost looks medieval, almost non-state based is possible. Or to take Neil Ferguson's view, that uh, China is developing in such a way that Europe will end up as an appendage to an Asian empire and that Europe will be a prosperous but not very powerful appendage at the end of Asia, at the end of a landmass that it has very little influence over. All those things are, pl are plausible. For Britain, the issue is, is both traditional and very new. It's traditional because China uh, conducts very traditional diplomacy in the South China Sea, in its first island chain, its second island chain. You know, it's very 19th century in its view of politics in those areas. Um, and we have, we have partners. Uh, we have partners in, in Vietnam and in Japan and in Taiwan and in Hong Kong. And so there's a very traditional series of, of challenges there, but a very s series of new challenges in terms of, if you like, the Huawei issue. Huawei is a good example of the uh, sort of, of um, economic structural security issues, and it's not the only one by any means, um, but it's a very good example of the new type of challenges that uh, we have to face, and there's just no right answers to these things. There's, there's a series of balances to try to be uh, achieved. So China is the big issue for our uh, ultimate future in the next 10 years in, because it, it will set the weather. China-America relationships, it sets the weather for everything else at the moment. Russia um, is a certainly a challenge that we're all aware of. It's a, re, a, re, a revanchist power, whether it's acting defensively or offensively, the symptoms are pretty well the same. Um, and I always say that Russia has, has the ability to be a damn nuisance for the next 10 years, but it shouldn't be more than a damn nuisance. If it is, if we let it, it's our own fault. Um, it, it has the ability to complicate everybody's lives, but Russia's on the wrong side of history. It is strategically going nowhere under its present leadership, and that leadership is not likely to change in, a, in an easy or, or good way. And Russian policy in relation to Europe uh, and the wider world and the Mediterranean, we can talk about it in discussion, um, none of that would matter very much if our transatlantic relationship with the United States was still as it was, but it isn't. And that's the third big geopolitical wheel. Um, and for us, it's the biggest call of all. And I go to what Sir Mark said about our relationship with the United States. I think there's some pretty fundamental questions to, our, to ask ourselves here. I mean, what President Trump represents is a, it's, it's not a spike, it's not, you know, Trump is not as eccentric in American policy as we might think. And what it represents is, is a Jacksonian nationalism. It's not isolationism, it's Jacksonian nationalism. Uh, a, a willingness to deal bilaterally, um, a sense that the United States, its, it, its main role in the world is to look after the interests of the United States, not the interests of the global community, unless that directly serves U.S. interests. And there is a, 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 a big shift of emphasis here. So, of course, we know we can always deal with difficult relationships between leaderships. We've done that many times before. We can deal with issues where we differ with the United States. Good heavens, we, we differed over the Vietnam War in a pretty fundamental way, and we dealt with that. What we can't deal with so easily is a difference of view of the nature of world politics and the nature of world order. So the question that we have to address is, is this United States moving towards a different conception of world order, of the rules-based order, of what it, what it represents? Because if it is, we'll find that very hard. We've already been on a roller coaster ride for the last 20 years. Uh, as we were holding on to a neocon 
um, uh, conception of foreign policy in the Bush administration, whilst telling our European partners, um, well, this, this gives us influence over the United States. Well, there's precious little evidence that we really had strategic influence over the US when it mattered. And it may well be that um, this, the, the, this sort of happy coincidence that we were able to um, uh, promote for many, many years, that it is morally right that we stick with the United States, and it's in our national interest too. There was no distinction between those two things. We were on the right side of history with the US, we were on the right side of world order, even if that relationship was difficult occasionally, and it was in our national interest. But we may be moving to a much bigger sense of, of division with the US, which and I, I don't know how that would go, but it, it worries me. And uh, that relates as well to the rules-based international order. It is under great pressure. That's now become a commonplace, not just in academic terms, but um, you know, it's in the newspapers now. And um, when you think about you know, issues that, that are already with us, I mean, the attitude towards Saudi Arabia over the Khashoggi murder, uh, the recognition of Jerusalem as capital of Israel, the recognition of, of Golan Heights, um, you know, this is, whether we like it or not, this is recognition of, uh, of territorial change by force or by war. And the Russians look at this very, very carefully. They're very comfortable with these declarations because it justifies Crimea, it justifies Ukraine, makes it much harder for uh, Britain to maintain its, its position on the rules-based international order. And then the other big geopolitical wheel is the wheel of the world economy. And uh, just two things to say about that, really. Since the economic crisis of 2008 had a major effect in transferring economic power and influence more strongly towards Asia, and any of the figures you care to look at will, you know, will show that. And you know, one figure that, that always sticks out to me is that um, between uh, uh, 2008 and projected 2023, the proportion of GDP that the uh, European Union um, uh, accounts for uh, drops from about 25% to about 12%. And there's, there's sort of an inevitability about that. And you look at the uh, growth rates in China, uh, growth rates in all of the Asian countries, in India, uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. That you're dealing with a, with a different order of magnitude. So there's big change um, uh, under, underway, of which the Belt and Road Initiative is a policy symptom of a structural change. And the other point about the world economy is that it's not clear, certainly to me, that the economic crisis is actually over. Um, we are still uh, indebted, we're still in love with debt in the world. Our indebtedness globally is almost 400% of global GDP. The only thing that has really changed as a result of the world economic crisis is the greater regulation on the banking system. Um, but, but as banks have, have, have leveraged or reduced their leverage, uh, sovereign states have increased their leverage, so the effect is more or less the same. Um, and if there is another crisis that begins in the next two or three years, uh, central banks have fewer levers to pull that will have any novel effect. They've pulled all the levers that they could in 2008, 2010. It will be harder to do that again a second time round. So that's a, a, a possibility. Which brings us back to... Uh, Brexit and what that means for Britain um, in the future. Um, Baron Sasha and I were having a conversation earlier on as to whether if Britain didn't now leave the European Union, how long would it take to, uh, as it were, to win back the ground that we might, may have lost? And there's some interesting um, ideas about that, which would be, be, be nice to, to talk about. But it seems to me that we did cross a Rubicon in 2016 in that whatever we do with Brexit now, we are, um, we're committed to being a different sort of power, at least for the medium term, short to medium term, within our European home. And we've got to try to make a, uh, make a success of that. I mean, at the moment, Brexit is the lens for everything. Uh, and I don't think any of us would probably disagree with that. And it's a bit like um, uh, finals examination questions. You know, the, 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 the questions are the same every year, but we change the answers. Um, and that's, in, in a way, is what it is. I mean, the questions for British policy remain the same, but the answers have all changed because Brexit changed the answers to everything in the sense that we have to, we have to use that lens to make the most of, of what we can do. So as far as the Middle East is concerned, finally, Britain in the Middle East, we're looking at, I think, bigger great power shifts in the Middle East 
between the role that the United States wants to play, the role that Russia is trying to play, the role that China might play in the, in the Middle East. And I worry that US and European priorities in the Middle East are diverging to a, a fairly considerable extent, certainly over Iran and, and other issues as well. And in the past, we would have said, well, that's an issue to be managed. You know, for Britain, if, if, if our American friends and our European friends um, are, are, are moving in slightly different directions, we've got to try to manage that. And I'm sure that's what we would still want to try to do. But I worry that we may come to a point where we, we can't manage, we have to choose. And that would be very difficult if that is the case. And I think that's a matter for some discussion. And the second thing uh, in relation to the Middle East is the regional shifts. One looks at the, the way in which different powers in the region, Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, this commonality of interest, which is not now um, denied at, at all, which is now being, uh, being seen in as positive a light uh, as it is, um, sets it against... Uh, regional politics, say in Qatar, which is still blockaded, but is dealing quite well with the blockade with, in the Gulf with uh, Kuwait and Oman, which take different views. Um, Jordan, which takes some different views. The, the, the regional dynamics of, uh, of the Middle East seem to me to be changing quite quickly. And that's something um, in which, which will pose big issues for Britain, um, particularly in the light of Brexit. And again, I offer that as a, as a matter for further discussion. Going back to um, my starting point with this study that I, I've done for uh, November, it's called Tipping Point, in that um, the choices that we are uh, liable, that we're having to make, can be made in all sorts of directions. And I very much agree with what Sir Mark said, that you know, the outcomes don't have to be bad, but they will be quite poor if we drift into them. Um, we, we are approaching a, a tipping point in the next few years. We can we can brigade our resources, we can face our policy choices um, very squarely, and we can make some choices, make some resource decisions. We can do all of that. Um, but we can't do it without a conscious effort. And unless we accept that we're at a tipping point, not just because of Brexit, but because of the, the geopolitical wheels of the 2020s, unless we accept that, then we will drift into what I think would be policy irrelevance. And that's a great shame because it doesn't have to be that way. Thank you.